Epigraph and Section One of The Trembling of a Leaf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lilith Brenda. The Trembling of a Leaf by W. Somerset Maugham. Epigraph and Section One. Epigraph. L'extrême félicité à peine séparée par une feuille tremblante de l'extrême désespoir. N'est-ce pas la vie? Saint Beuve. End of epigraph. Section 1. The Pacific. The Pacific is inconstant and uncertain like the soul of man. Sometimes it is grey like the English channel off Beachy Head with a heavy swell, and sometimes it is rough capped with white crests and boisterous it is not so often that it is calm and blue then indeed the blue is arrogant the sun shines fiercely from an unclouded sky the trade wind gets into your blood and you are filled with an impatience for the unknown the billows magnificently rolling stretch widely on all sides of you and you forget your vanished youth with these memories, cruel and sweet, in a restless, intolerable desire for life. On such a sea as this, Ulysses sailed when he sought the happy isles. But there are days also when the Pacific is like a lake. The sea is flat and shining, the flying fish, a gleam of shadow on the brightness of a mirror, make little fountains of sparkling drops when they dip. There are fleecy clouds on the horizon, and at sunset they take strange shapes, so that it is impossible not to believe that you see a range of lofty mountains. They are the mountains of the country of your dreams. You sail through an unimaginable silence upon a magic sea. Now and then, a few gulls suggest that land is not far off, a forgotten island hidden in a wilderness of waters but the gulls the melancholy gulls are the only sign you have of it you see never a tramp with its friendly smoke no stately bark or trimmed schooner not a fishing boat even it is an empty desert and presently the emptiness fills you with a vague foreboding end of section one Section two of the trembling of a leaf by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two, Mackintosh, Part one. He splashed about for a few minutes in the sea. It was too shallow to swim in, and for fear of sharks, could not go out of his death. Then he got out and went into the bathhouse for a shower. The coldness of the fresh water was grateful after the heavy stickiness of the salt Pacific, so warm. So it was only just after seven that to bathe in it did not brace you, but rather increased your languor. And when he had dried himself, slipping into a bath gown, he called out to the Chinese cook that he would be ready for breakfast in five minutes. He walked barefoot across the patch of coarse grass which Walker, the administrator, proudly thought was a lawn, to his own quarters and dressed. This did not take long, for he put on nothing but a shirt and a pair of duck trousers, and then went over to his chief's house on the other side of the compound. The two men had their meals together, but the Chinese cook told him that Walker had set out on horseback at five and would not be back for another hour. Mackintosh had slept badly, and he looked with distaste at the pawpaw and the eggs and bacon which were set before him. The mosquitoes had been maddening that night. They flew about the net under which he slept in such numbers that their humming, pitiless and menacing, had the effect of a note, infinitely drawn out, played on a distant organ and whenever he dozed off he awoke with a start and the belief that one had found his way inside his curtains it was so hot that he laid naked he turned from side to side and gradually the dull roar of the breakers on the reef so unceasing and so regular that generally he did not hear it 
grew distinct on his consciousness its rhythm hammered on his tired nerves and he held himself with clenched hands in the effort to bear it the thought that nothing could stop that sound for it would continue to all eternity was almost impossible to bear and as though his strength were a match for the ruthless forces of nature he had an insane impulse to do some violent thing he felt he must cling to his self-control or he would go mad and now looking out of the window at the lagoon and the strip of foam which marked the reef he shuddered with hatred of the brilliant scene the cloudless sky was like an inverted ball that hemmed it in he lit his pipe and turned over the pile of auckland papers that had come over from apia a few days before the newest of them was three weeks old they gave an impression of incredible dullness then he went into the office it was a large bare room with two desks in it and a bench along one side a number of natives were seated on this and a couple of women they gossiped while they waited for the administrator and when mackintosh came in they greeted him talofa lee he returned their greeting and sat down at his desk he began to write working on a report which the governor of samoa had been clamouring for and which walker with his usual dilatoriness had neglected to prepare mackintosh as he made his notes reflected vindictively that walker was late with his report because he was so illiterate that he had an invincible distaste for anything to do with pens and paper and now when he was at last ready concise and neatly official he would accept his subordinate's work without a word of appreciation with a sneer rather or a gibe and sent it on to his own superior as though it were his own composition he could not have written a word of it mackintosh thought with rage that if his chief penciled in some insertion it would be childish in expression and faulty in language if he remonstrated or sought to put his meaning into an intelligible phrase walker would fly into a passion and cry what the hell do i care about grammar that's what i want to say and that's how i want to say it at last walker came in the native surrounded him as he entered trying to get his immediate attention but he turned on them roughly and told them to sit down and hold their tongues he threatened that if they were not quiet he would have them all turned out and see none of them that day he nodded to mackintosh hello mac up at last i don't know how you can waste the best part of the day in bed you ought to have been up before dawn like me lazy beggar he threw himself heavily into his chair and wiped his face with a large bandana by heaven i've got a thirst he turned to the policeman who stood at the door a picturesque figure in his white jacket and lava lava the loincloth of the samoan and told him to bring kava the kava bowl stood on the floor in the corner of the room and the policeman filled a half coconut shell and brought it to walker he poured a few drops on the ground murmured the customary words to the company and drank with relish then he told the policeman to serve the waiting natives and the shell was handed to each one in order of birth or importance and emptied with the same ceremonies then he set about the day's work he was a little man considerably less than of middle height and enormously stout he had a large fleshy face clean-shaven with the cheeks hanging on each side in great dew laps and three fast chins his small features were all dissolved in fat and but for a crescent of white hair at the back of his head he was completely bald he reminded you of mr pickwick he was grotesque a figure of fun and yet strangely enough not without dignity his blue eyes behind large gold-rimmed spectacles were shrilled and vivacious and there was a great deal of determination in his face he was sixty but his native vitality triumphed over advancing years notwithstanding his corpulence his movements were quick and he walked with a heavy resolute tread as though he sought to impress his weight upon the earth he spoke in a loud gruff voice it was two years now since mackintosh had been appointed walker's assistant walker 
who had been for a quarter of a century administrator of talua one of the larger islands in the samoan group was a man known in person or by report through the length and breadth of the south seas and it was with lively curiosity that mackintosh looked forward to his first meeting with him for one reason or another he stayed a couple of weeks at apia before he took up his post and both at chaplin's hotel and at the english club he heard innumerable stories about the administrator he thought now with irony of his interest in them since then he had heard them a hundred times from walker himself walker knew that he was a character and proud of his reputation deliberately acted up to it he was jealous of his legend and anxious that you should know the exact details of any of the celebrated stories that were told of him he was ludicrously angry with anyone who had told them to the stranger incorrectly there was a rough cordiality about walker which mackintosh at first found not unattractive and walker glad to have a listener to whom all he said was fresh gave of his best he was good-humoured hearty and considerate to mackintosh who had lived the sheltered life of a government official in london till at the age of thirty-four an attack of pneumonia leaving him with the threat of tuberculosis had forced him to seek a post in the pacific walker's existence seemed extraordinarily romantic the adventure with which he started on his conquest of circumstance was typical of the man he ran away to sea when he was fifteen and for over a year was employed in shuffling coal on a collier he was an undersized boy and both men and maids were kind to him but the captain for some reason conceived a savage dislike of him he used the lad cruelly so that bitten and kicked he often could not sleep for the pain that racked his limbs he loathed the captain with all his soul then he was given a tip for some race and managed to borrow twenty-five pounds from a friend he had picked up in belfast he put it on a horse an outsider at long odds he had no means of repaying the money if he lost but it never occurred to him that he could lose he felt himself in luck the horse won and he found himself with something over a thousand pounds in hard cash now his chance had come he found out who was the best solicitor in the town the collier lay then somewhere on the irish coast went to him and tell him that he heard the ship was for sale asked him to arrange the purchase for him the solicitor was amused at his small client he was only sixteen and did not look so old and moved perhaps by sympathy promised not only to arrange the matter for him but to see that he made a good bargain after a little while walker found himself the owner of the ship he went back to her and had what he described as the most glorious moment of his life when he gave the skipper notice and told him that he must get off his ship in half an hour he made a mate captain and sailed on the collier for another nine months at the end of which he sold her at a profit he came out to the islands at the age of twenty-six as a planter he was one of the few white men settled in talua at the time of the german occupation and had then already some influence with the natives the germans made him administrator a position which he occupied for twenty years and when the island was seized by the british he was confirmed in his post he ruled the island despotically but with complete success the prestige of this success was another reason for the interest that mackintosh took in him but the two men were not made to get on mackintosh was an ugly man with ungainly gestures a tall thin fellow with a narrow chest and bowed shoulders he had sallow sunken cheeks and his eyes were large and sombre he was a great reader and when his books arrived and were unpacked walker came over to his quarters and looked at them then he turned to mackintosh with a coarse laugh what in hell have you brought all this muck for he asked mackintosh flushed darkly i'm sorry you think it muck i brought my books because i want to read them when you said you'd got a lot of book coming i thought there'd be something for me to read haven't you got any detective stories detective stories don't interest me 
You're a damned fool, then. I'm content that you should think so. Every mail brought Walker a mass of periodical literature, papers from New Zealand, magazines from America, and it exasperated him that Mackintosh showed his contempt for these ephemeral publications. He had no patience with the books that absorbed Mackintosh's leisure and thought it only a pose that he read Gibbon's Decline and Fall or Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. And since he had never learned to put any restraint on his tongue, he expressed his opinion of his assistant freely. Mackintosh began to see the real man, and under the boisterous good humour he discerned a vulgar cunning which was hateful. He was vain and domineering, and it was strange that he had notwithstanding a shyness which made him dislike people who were not quite of his kidney. He judged others, naively, by their language, and if it was free from the oath and the obscenity which made up the greater part of his own conversation, he looked upon them with suspicion. In the evening, the two men played piquet. He played badly, but being gloriously, crowing over his opponent when he won, and losing his temper when he lost. On rare occasions, a couple of planters or traders would drive over to play bridge, and then Walker showed himself in what Mackintosh considered a characteristic light. He played regardless of his partner, calling up in his desire to play the hand, and argued interminably, beating down the position by the loudness of his voice. He constantly revoked, and when he did so, sat with an ingratiating whine. Oh, you wouldn't count it against an old man who can hardly see. Did he know that his opponents thought it as well to keep on the right side of him, and hesitated to insist on the rigour of the game? Mackintosh watched him with an icy contempt. When the game was over, while they smoked their pipes and drank whisky, they would begin telling stories. Walker told with gusto the story of his marriage. He had got so drunk at the wedding feast that the bride had fled, and he had never seen her since. He had had numberless adventures, commonplace and sordid, with the women of the island, and he described them with a pride in his own prowess, which was an offence to Mackintosh's fastidious ears. He was a gross, sensual old man. He thought Mackintosh a poor fellow, because he would not share his promiscuous amours, and remained sober when the company was drunk. He despised him also for the orderliness with which he did his official work. Mackintosh liked to do everything just so. His desk was always tidy. His papers were always neatly docketed. He could put his hand on any document that was needed, and he had at his fingers' ends all the regulations that were required for the business of the administration. Fudge, fudge, said Walker. I've run this island for twenty years without red tape, and I don't want it now. Does it make it any easier for you that when you want a letter you have to hunt half an hour for it? Answered Mackintosh. You are nothing but a damned official, but you're not a bad fellow. When you've been out here a year or two, you'll be all right. What's wrong about you is that you won't drink. You wouldn't be a bad sort if you got soused once a week. The curious thing was that Walker remained perfectly unconscious of the dislike for him which every month increased in the breast of his subordinate. Although he laughed at him, as he grew accustomed to him, he began almost to like him. He had a certain tolerance for the peculiarities of others, and he accepted Mackintosh as a queer fish. Perhaps he liked him, unconsciously, because he could chaff him. His humour consisted of coarse banter and wanted a butt. Mackintosh's exactness, his morality, his sobriety were all fruitful subjects. His Scots name gave an opportunity for the usual jokes about Scotland. He enjoyed himself thoroughly when two or three men were there, and he could make them all laugh at the expense of Mackintosh. He would say ridiculous things about him to the natives, and Mackintosh, his knowledge of Samoan still imperfect, would see their unrestrained mirth when Walker had made an obscene reference to him. He smiled good-humouredly. "'I'll say this for you, Mac,' Walker would say in his gruff, loud voice. "'You can take a joke.' "'Was it a joke?' smiled Mackintosh. I didn't know. Scots were here, shouted Walker with a bellow of laughter. 
there's only one way to make a scotchman see a joke and that's by a surgical operation walker little knew that there was nothing mackintosh could stand less than chaff he would wake in the night the breathless night of the rainy season and brood sullenly over the gibe that walker had uttered carelessly days before it rankled his heart swelled with rage and he pictured to himself ways in which he might get even with the bully he had tried answering him but walker had a gift of repartee coarse and obvious which gave him an advantage the dullness of his intellect made him impervious to a delicate shaft his self-satisfaction made it impossible to wound him his loud voice his bellow of laughter were weapons against which mackintosh had nothing to counter and he learned that the wisest thing was never to betray his irritation he learned to control himself but his hatred grew till it was the monomania he watched walker with an insane vigilance he fed his own self-esteem by every instance of meanness on walker's part by every exhibition of childish vanity of cunning and of vulgarity walker ate greedily noisily filthily and mackintosh watched him with satisfaction he took note of the foolish things he said and of his mistakes in grammar he knew that walker held him in small esteem and he found a bitter satisfaction in his chief's opinion of him it increased his own contempt for the narrow complacent old man and it gave him a singular pleasure to know that walker was entirely unconscious of the hatred he felt for him he was a fool who liked popularity and he blandly fancied that everyone admired him once mackintosh had overheard walker speaking of him he'll be all right when i've licked him into shape he said he's a good dog and he loves his master mackintosh silently without a movement of his long sallow face laughed long and heartily but his hatred was not blind on the contrary he was peculiarly clear-sighted and he judged walker's capabilities with precision he ruled his small kingdom with efficiency he was just and honest with opportunities to make money he was a poorer man than when he was first appointed to his post and his only support for his old age was the pension which he expected when at last he retired from official life his pride was that with an assistant and a half-caste clerk he was able to administer the island more competently than apulu the island of which apia is the chief town was a minister with his army of functionaries he had a few native policemen to sustain his authority but he made no use of them he governed by bluff and his irish humour they insist on building a jail for me he said what the devil do i want a jail for i'm not going to put the natives in prison if they do wrong i know how to deal with them one of his quarrels with the higher authorities at apia was that he claimed entire jurisdiction over the natives of his island whatever their crimes he would not give them up to courts competent to deal with them and several times an angry correspondence had passed between him and the governor at apulu for he looked upon the natives as his children and that was the amazing thing about this coarse vulgar selfish man he loved the island on which he had lived so long with passion and he had for the natives a strange rough tenderness which was quite wonderful he loved to ride about the island on his old grey mare and he was never tired of his beauty sauntering along the grassy roads among the coconut trees he would stop every now and then to admire the loveliness of the scene now and then he would come upon a native village and stop while the headman brought him a bowl of kaffa he would look at the little group of bell-shaped huts with their high thatched roofs like beehives and a smile would spread over his fat face his eyes rested happily on the spreading green of the breadfruit trees by george it's like the garden of eden sometimes his rides took him along the coast and through the trees he had a glimpse of the wide sea empty with never a sail to disturb the loneliness sometimes he climbed a hill so that a great stretch of country with little villages nestling among the tall trees was spread out before him like the kingdom of the world 
and he would sit there for an hour in an ecstasy of delight but he had no words to express his feelings and to relieve them would utter an obscene jest it was as though his emotion was so violent that he needed vulgarity to break the tension mackintosh observed this sentiment with an icy disdain walker had always been a heavy drinker he was proud of his capacity to see men half his age under the table when he spent a night in apia and he had the sentimentality of the topper he could cry over the stories he read in his magazines and yet would refuse a loan to some trader in difficulties whom he had known for twenty years he was close with his money once mackintosh said to him no one could accuse you of giving money away he took it as a compliment his enthusiasm for nature was but the drivelling sensibility of the drunkard nor had mackintosh any sympathy for his chief's feelings towards the natives he loved them because they were in his power as a selfish man loves his dog and his mentality was on a level with theirs their humour was obscene and he was never at a loss for the lewd remark he understood them and they understood him he was proud of his influence over them he looked upon them as his children and he mixed himself in all their affairs but he was very jealous of his authority if he read them with a rod of iron brooking no contradiction he would not suffer any of the white men on the island to take advantage of them he watched the missionaries suspiciously and if they did anything of which he disapproved was able to make life so unendurable to them that if he could not get them removed they were glad to go of their own accord his power over the natives was so great that on his word they would refuse labour and food to their pastor on the other hand he showed the traders no favour he took care that they should not cheat the natives he saw that they got a fair reward for their work in their copra and that the traders made no extravagant profit on the wares they sold them he was merciless to a bargain that he thought unfair sometimes the traders would complain at apia that they did not get fair opportunities they suffered for it walker then hesitated at no calumny at no outrageous lie to get even with them and they found that if they wanted not only to live at peace but to exist at all they had to accept the situation on his own terms more than once the store of a trader obnoxious to him had been burned down and there was only the appositeness of the event to show that the administrator had instigated it once a swedish half-caste ruined by the burning had gone to him and roundly accused him of arson walker laughed in his face you dirty dog your mother was a native and you tried to cheat the natives if your rotten old store is burnt down is a judgment of providence that's what it is a judgment of providence get out and as the man was hustled out by two native policemen the administrator laughed fatly a judgment of providence and now mackintosh watched him enter upon the day's work he began with the sick for walker added doctoring to his other activities and he had a small room behind the office full of drugs an elderly man came forward a man with a crop of curly grey hair in a blue lava lava elaborately tattooed with the skin of his body wrinkled like a wine skin what have you come for walker asked him abruptly in a whining voice the man said that he could not eat without vomiting and that he had pains here and pains there go to the missionaries said walker you know that i only cure children I have been to the missionaries and they do me no good then go home and prepare yourself to die have you lived so long and still want to go on living you are a fool the man broke into querulous expostulation but walker pointing to a woman with a sick child in her arms told her to bring it to his desk he asked her questions and looked at the child i will give you medicine he said he turned to the half-caste clerk go into the dispenser and bring me some calomel pills he made the child swallow one there and then and gave another to the mother take the child away and keep it warm to-morrow it will be dead or better he leaned back in his chair and lit his pipe wonderful stuff calomel 
I've saved more lives with it than all the hospital doctors in Apia put together. Walker was very proud of his skill, and with the dogmatism of ignorance had no patience with the members of the medical profession. The sort of case I like, he said, is the one that all the doctors have given up as hopeless. When the doctors have said they can't cure you, I say to them, come to me. Did I ever tell you about a fellow who had a cancer? Frequently, said Mackintosh. I got him right in three months. You've never told me about the people you haven't cured. He finished this part of the work and went on to the rest. It was a queer medley. There was a woman who could not get on with her husband, and a man who complained that his wife had run away from him. Lucky dog, said Walker. Most men wish their wives would too. There was a long, complicated quarrel about the ownership of a few yards of land. There was a dispute about the sharing out of a catch of fish. There was a complaint against a white trader because he had given short measure. Walker listened attentively to every case, made up his mind quickly, and gave his decision. Then he would listen to nothing more. If the complainant went on, he was hustled out of the office by a policeman. Mackintosh listened to it all with sullen irritation. On the whole, perhaps, it might be admitted that rough justice was done, but it exasperated the assistant that his chief trusted his instinct rather than the evidence. He would not listen to reason. He browbeat the witnesses, and when they did not see what he wished them to, called them thieves and liars. He left to the last a group of men who were sitting in a corner of the room. He had deliberately ignored them. The party consisted of an old chief, a tall, dignified man with short white hair, and a new lava lava bearing a huge fly-wisp as a badge of office, his son, and half a dozen of the important men of the village. Walker had had a feud with them and had beaten them. As was characteristic of him, he meant now to rub in his victory, and because he had them down to profit by their helplessness. The facts were peculiar. Walker had a passion for building roads. When he had come to Talua, there were but a few tracks here and there, but in course of time he had cut roads through the country, joining the villages together, and it was to this that a great part of the island's prosperity was due, whereas in the old days it had been impossible to get the produce of the land, copper chiefly, down to the coast, where it could be put on schooners or motor launches, and so taken to Apia. Now transport was easy and simple. His ambition was to make a road right round the island, and a great part of it was already built. In two years I shall have done it, and then I can die or they can fire me, I don't care. His roads were the joy of his heart, and he made excursions constantly to see that they were kept in order. They were simple enough, wide tracks, grass covered, cut through the scrub or through the plantations, but trees had to be rooted out, rocks stuck up or blasted, and here and there levelling had been necessary. He was proud that he had surmounted by his own skill such difficulties as they presented. He rejoiced in his disposition of them, so that they were not only convenient, but showed off the beauties of the island which he so loved. When he spoke of his roads, he was almost a poet. They meandered through those lovely scenes, and Walker had taken care that here and there they should run in a straight line, giving you a green vista through the tall trees, and here and there should turn and curve, so that the heart was rested by the diversity. It was amazing that this coarse and sensual man should exercise so subtle an ingenuity to get the effects which his fancy suggested to him. He had used in making his roads all the fantastic skill of a Japanese gardener, he received a grant from headquarters for the work, but took a curious pride in using but a small part of it, and the year before had spent only a hundred pounds of the thousand assigned to him. What do they want money for? He boomed. They only spend it on all kinds of muck they don't want. What the missionaries leave them, that is to say. For no particular reason, except perhaps pride in the economy of his administration, and the desire to contrast his efficiency with the wasteful methods of the authorities at Apia. 
he got the natives to do the work he wanted for wages that were almost nominal it was owing to this that he had lately had difficulty with the village whose chief men now were come to see him the chief's son had been in Apulu for a year and on coming back had told his people of the large sums that were paid at apia for the public works in long idle talks he had inflamed their hearts with the desire for gain he held out to them visions of vast wealth and they thought of the whisky they could buy it was dear since there was a law that it must not be sold to natives and so it cost them double what the white man had to pay for it they thought of the great sandalwood boxes in which they kept their treasures and the scented soup and potted salmon the luxuries for which the kanaka would sell his soul so that when the administrator sent for them and told them he wanted a road made from the village to a certain pond along the coast and offered them twenty pounds they asked him a hundred the chief's son was called manuma he was a tall handsome fellow copper-coloured with his fussy hair dyed red with lime a wreath of red berries round his neck and behind his ear a flower like a scarlet flame against his brown face the upper part of his body was naked but to show that he was no longer a savage since he had lived in apia he wore a pair of dungarees instead of a lava lava he told them that if they held together the administrator would be obliged to accept their terms his heart was set on building the road and when he found they would not work for less he would give them what they asked but they must not move whatever he said they must not abate their claim they had asked a hundred and that they must keep to when they mentioned the figure walker burst into a shout of his long deep-voiced laughter he told them not to make fools of themselves but to set about the work at once because he was in a good humour that day he promised to give them a feast when the road was finished but when he found no attempt was made to start work he went to the village and asked the men what silly game they were playing manuma had coached them well they were quite calm they did not attempt to argue an argument is a passion with a kanaka they merely shrugged their shoulders they would do it for a hundred pounds and if he would not give them that they would do no work he could please himself they did not care then walker flew into a passion he was ugly then his short fat neck swelled ominously his red face grew purple he foamed at the mouth he sat upon the natives with invective he knew well how to wound and how to humiliate it was terrifying the older men grew pale and uneasy they hesitated if it had not been for manuma with his knowledge of the great world and their dread of his ridicule they would have yielded it was manuma who answered walker pay us a hundred pounds and we will work walker shaking his fist at him called him every name he could think of he riddled him with scorn manuma sat still and smiled there may have been more bravado than confidence in his smile but he had to make a good show before the others he repeated his words pay us a hundred pounds and we will work they thought that walker would spring on him it would not have been the first time they had thrashed the native with his own hands they knew his strength and though walker was three times the age of the young man and six inches shorter so did not doubt that he was more than a match for manuma no one had ever thought of resisting the savage onslaught of the administrator but walker said nothing he chuckled i am not going to waste my time with a pack of fools he said talk it over again you know what i have offered if you do not start in a week take care he turned round and walked out of the chief's hut he untied his own mare and it was typical of the relations between him and the natives that one of the elder men hung on to the off stirrup while walker from a convenient boulder hoisted himself heavily into the saddle that same night when walker according to his habit was strolling along the road that ran past his house he heard something wheeze past him and with a thought strike a tree something had been thrown at him he ducked instinctively with a shout who's that 
he ran towards the place from which the missile had come and he heard the sound of a man escaping through the bush he knew it was hopeless to pursue in the darkness and besides he was soon out of breath so he stopped and made his way back to the road he looked about for what had been thrown but could find nothing it was quite dark he went quickly back to the house and called mackintosh and the chinese boy one of those devils has thrown something at me come along and let's find out what it was he told the boy to bring a lantern and the three of them made their way back to the place they hunted about the ground they could not find what they sought suddenly the boy gave a guttural cry they turned to look he held up the lantern and there sinister in the light that cut the surrounding darkness was a long knife sticking into the trunk of a coconut tree it had been thrown with such force that it required quite an effort to pull it out by george if you hadn't missed me i'd have been in a nice state walker handled the knife it was one of those knives made in imitation of the sailor knives brought to the islands a hundred years before by the first white men used to divide the coconuts in two so that the copper might be dried it was a murderous weapon and the blade twelve inches long was very sharp walker chuckled softly the devil the impudent devil he had no doubt it was manuma who had flung the knife he had escaped death by three inches he was not angry on the contrary he was in high spirits the adventure accelerated him and when he got back to the house, calling for drinks, he rubbed his hands gleefully. I'll make them pay for this. His little eyes twinkled. He blew himself out like a turkey cock, and for the second time within half an hour, insisted on telling Mackintosh every detail of the affair. Then he asked him to play piquet, and while they played, he boasted of his intentions. Mackintosh listened with tightened lips. But why should you grind them down like this? he asked. Twenty pounds is precious little for the work you want them to do. They ought to be precious thankful we give them anything. Hang it all. It's not your own money. The government allots you a reasonable sum. They won't complain if you spend it. They're a bunch of fools at Apia. Mackintosh saw that Walker's motive was merely vanity. He shrugged his shoulders. It won't do you much good to score off the fellows at Apia at the cost of your life. Bless you. They wouldn't hurt me, these people. They couldn't do without me. They worship me. Manuma is a fool. He only threw that knife to frighten me. The next day, Walker rode over again to the village. He was called Matotu. He did not get off his horse. When he reached the chief's house, he saw that the men were sitting round the floor in a circle, talking and he guessed they were discussing again the question of the road. The Samoan huts are formed in this way. Trunks of slender trees are placed in a circle at intervals of perhaps five or six feet. A tall tree is set in the middle, and from this downwards slopes the thatched roof. Venetian blinds of coconut leaves can be pulled down at night, or when it is raining. Ordinarily, the hut is open all round, so that the breeze can blow through freely walker rode to the edge of the hut and called out to the chief oh there tangatu your son left his knife in the tree last night i have brought it back to you he flung it down on the ground in the midst of the circle and with a low burst of laughter ambled off on monday he went out to see if they had started work there was no sign of it he rode through the village the inhabitants were about their ordinary avocations some were weaving mats of the pandanus leaf one old man was busy with a kaffa ball the children were playing the women went about their household chores walker a smile on his lips came to the chief's house talofa li said the chief talofa answered walker manuma was making a net he sat with a cigarette between his lips and looked up at walker with a smile of triumph you have decided that you will not make the road the chief answered not unless you pay us one hundred pounds you will regret it he turned to manuma and you my lad i shouldn't wonder if your back was very sore before you were much older he rode away chuckling he left the natives vaguely uneasy they feared the fat sinful old man 
and neither the missionary's abuse of him nor the scorn which manuma had learned in apia made them forget that he had a devilish cunning and that no man had ever braved him without in the long run suffering for it they found out within twenty-four hours what scheme he had devised it was characteristic but next morning a great band of men women and children came into the village and the chief men said that they had made a bargain with walker to build the road he had offered them twenty pounds and they had accepted now the cunning lay in this that the polynesians have rules of hospitality which have all the force of laws an etiquette of absolute rigidity made it necessary for the people of the village not only to give lodging to the strangers but to provide them with food and drink as long as they wished to stay the inhabitants of matotu were outwitted every morning the workers went out in a joyous band cut down trees blasted rocks levelled here and there and then in the evening tramped back again and ate and drank ate heartily danced sang hymns and enjoyed life for them it was a picnic but soon their hosts began to wear long faces the strangers had enormous appetites and the plantains and the breadfruit vanished before their rapacity the alligator pear trees whose fruit sent to apia might sell for good money were stripped bare ruin stared them in the face and then they found that the strangers were working very slowly had they received a hint from walker that they might take their time at this rate by the time the road was finished there would not be a scrap of food in the village and worse than this they were a laughing stock when one or other of them went to some distant hamlet on an errand he found that the story had got there before him and he was met with derisive laughter there is nothing the kanaka can endure less than ridicule it was not long before much angry talk passed among the sufferers manuma was no longer a hero he had to put up with a good deal of plain speaking and one day what walker had suggested came to pass a heated argument turned into a quarrel and half a dozen of the young men set upon the chief's son and gave him such a beating that for a week he lay bruised and sore on the pandanus mats. He turned from side to side and could find no ease. Every day or two, the administrator rode over on his old mare and watched the progress of the road. He was not a man to resist the temptation of taunting the fallen foe, and he missed no opportunity to rub into the shamed inhabitants of Mantotu the bitterness of their humiliation. He broke their spirit, and one morning, putting their pride in their pockets, a figure of speech, since pockets they had not, they all set out with the strangers and started working on the road. It was urgent to get it done quickly if they wanted to save any food at all, and the whole village joined in. But they worked silently, with rage and mortification in their hearts, and even the children toiled in silence. The women wept as they carried away bundles of brushwood. When Walker saw them, he laughed so much that he almost rolled out of his saddle. The news spread quickly and tickled the people of the island to death. This was the greatest joke of all, the crowning triumph of that cunning old white man whom no Kanaka had ever been able to circumvent. They came from distant villages, with their wives and children, to look at the foolish folk who had refused twenty pounds to make the road and now were forced to work for nothing. But the harder they worked, the more easily went the guests. Why should they hurry when they were getting good food for nothing? And the longer they took about the job, the better the trick became. At last, the wretched villagers could stand it no longer, and they were come this morning to beg the administrator to send the strangers back to their own homes. If he would do this, they promised to finish the road themselves for nothing. For him, it was a victory complete and unqualified. They were humbled. A look of arrogant complacence spread over his large, naked face, and he seemed to swell in his chair like a great bullfrog. There was something sinister in his appearance so that Mackintosh shivered with disgust. Then in his booming tones he began to speak. Is it for my good that I make the road? What benefit do you think I get out of it? 
it is for you so that you can walk in comfort and carry your copper in comfort i offered to pay you for your work though it was for your own sake the work was done i offered to pay you generously now you must pay i will send the people of manua back to their homes if you will finish the road and pay the twenty pounds that i have to pay them End of section two mackintosh part one Section three of the Trembling of a Leaf by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mackintosh, Part Two. There was an outcry. They sought to reason with him. They told him they had not the money, but to everything they said he replied with brutal jibes. Then the clock struck. Dinner time, he said. Turn them all out. He raised himself heavily from his chair and walked out of the room. When Mackintosh followed him, he found him already seated at table, a napkin tied round his neck. Holding his knife and fork in readiness for the meal the Chinese cook was about to bring, he was in high spirits. I didn't done fine, he said, as Mackintosh sat down. I shan't have much trouble with the rose after this. I suppose you were joking, said Mackintosh icily. What do you mean by that? You're not really going to make them pay twenty pounds. You bet your life I am. I'm not sure you've got any right to. Ain't you? I guess I've got the right to do any damned thing I like on this island. I think you've bullied them quite enough. Walker laughed fatly. He did not care what Mackintosh thought. When I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. Mackintosh grew very white. He knew by bitter experience that he could do nothing but keep silence, and violent effort at self-control made him sick and faint. He could not eat the food that was before him, and with disgust he watched Walker shuffle meat into his fast mouth. He was a dirty feeder, and to sit at table with him needed a strong stomach. Mackintosh shuddered. A tremendous desire seized him to humiliate that gross and cruel man. He would give anything in the world to see him in the dust, suffering as much as he had made others suffer. He had never loathed the bully with such loathing as now. The day wore on. Mackintosh tried to sleep after dinner, but the passion in his heart prevented him. He tried to read, but the letters swarmed before his eyes. The sun beat down pitilessly, and he longed for rain, but he knew that rain would bring no coolness. It would only make it hotter and more steamy. He was a native of Aberdeen, and his heart yearned suddenly for the icy winds that whistled through the granite streets of that city. Here he was a prisoner, imprisoned not only by that placid sea, but by his hatred for that horrible old man. He pressed his hands to his aching head. He would like to kill him, but he pulled himself together, he must do something to distract his mind, and since he could not read, he thought he would set his private papers in order. It was a job which he had long meant to do, and which he had constantly put off. He unlocked the drawer of his desk, and took out a handful of letters. He caught sight of his revolver. An impulse, no sooner realised than set aside, to put a bullet through his head and so escape from the intolerable bondage of life flashed through his mind he noticed that in the damp air the revolver was slightly rusted and he got an oil rag and began to clean it it was while he was thus occupied that he grew aware of someone slinking round the door he looked up and called who is there there was a moment's pause then manuma showed himself what do you want the chief's son stood for a moment sullen and silent and when he spoke it was with a strangled voice we can't pay twenty pounds we haven't the money what am i to do said mackintosh you heard what mr walker said manuma began to plead half in samoan and half in english it was a sing-song whine with the quavering intonation of a beggar and it filled mackintosh with disgust it outraged him that the man should let himself be so crushed. 
he was a pitiful object. I can do nothing, said Mackintosh irritably. You know that Mr. Walker is master here. Manuma was silent again. He still stood in the doorway. I am sick, he said at last. Give me some medicine. What is the matter with you? I do not know. I am sick. I have pains in my body. Don't stand there, said Mackintosh sharply. Come in and let me look at you. Manuma entered the little room and stood before the desk. I have pains here and here. He put his hands to his loins, and his face assumed an expression of pain. Suddenly, Mackintosh grew conscious that the boy's eyes were resting on the revolver, which he had laid on the desk when Manuma appeared in the doorway. There was a silence between the two, which to Mackintosh was endless. He seemed to read the thoughts which were in the Kanaka's mind. His heart beat violently. And then he felt as though something possessed him so that he acted under the compulsion of a foreign will. He himself did not make the movements of his body, but a power that was strange to him. His throat was suddenly dry, and he put his hand to it mechanically in order to help his speech. He was impelled to avoid Manuma's eyes. Just wait here, he said. His voice sounded as though someone had seized him by the windpipe. And now fetch you something from the dispensary. He got up. Was it his fancy that he staggered a little? Manuma stood silently, and though he kept his eyes averted, Mackintosh knew that he was looking dully out of the door. It was this other person that possessed him, that drove him out of the room. But it was himself that took a handful of muddled paper and threw them on the revolver in order to hide it from view. He went to the dispensary. He got a pill and poured out some blue draught into a small bottle, and then came out into the compound. He did not want to go back into his own bungalow, so he called the Manuma. Come here. He gave him the drugs and instructions how to take them. He did not know what it was that made it impossible for him to look at the Kanaka. While he was speaking to him, he kept his eyes on his shoulder, Manuma took the medicine and slunk out of the gate. Mackintosh went into the dining room and turned over once more the old newspapers. But he could not read them. The house was very still. Walker was upstairs in his room asleep. The Chinese cook was busy in the kitchen. The two policemen were out fishing. The silence that seemed to brood over the house was unearthly. And there hammered in Mackintosh's head question whether the revolver still lay where he had placed it. He could not bring himself to look. The uncertainty was horrible, but the certainty would be more horrible still. He sweated. At last he could stand the silence no longer, and he made up his mind to go down the road to the traders, a man named Jervis, who had a store about a mile away. He was a half-caste, but even that amount of white blood made him possible to talk to. He wanted to get away from his bungalow, with the desk littered with untidy papers, and underneath them something, or nothing. He walked along the road. As he passed the fine hut of a chief, a greeting was called out to him. Then he came to the store. Behind the counter sat the trader's daughter, a swarthy, broad-featured girl in a pink blouse and a white drill skirt. Jervis hoped he would marry her. He had money, and he had told Mackintosh that his daughter's husband would be well-to-do. She flushed a little when she saw Mackintosh. Father's just unpacking some cases that have come in this morning. I'll tell him you're here. He sat down, and the girl went out behind the shop. In a moment, her mother's waddled in, a huge old woman, a chiefess, who owned much land in her own right, and gave him her hand. Her monstrous obesity was an offence, but she managed to convey an impression of dignity. She was cordial with her obsequiousness, affable, but conscious of her station. You are quite a stranger, Mr. Mackintosh. Teresa was saying only this morning, Why, we never see Mr. Mackintosh now. He shuddered a little as he thought of himself as that old native's son-in-law. 
It was notorious that she ruled her husband, notwithstanding his white blood, with a firm hand. Hers was the authority, and hers the business head. She might be no more than Mrs. Jervis to the white people, but her father had been a chief of the blood royal, and his father and his father's father had ruled as kings. The trader came in, small beside his imposing wife, a dark man with a black beard going grey, in ducks, with handsome eyes and flashing teeth. He was very British, and his conversation was slangy, but you felt he spoke English as a foreign tongue. With his family he used the language of his native mother. He was a servile man, cringing and obsequious. Ah, Mr. Mackintosh, this is a joyful surprise. Get the whisky, Teresa. Mr. Mackintosh will have a gargle with us. He gave all the latest news of Apia, watching his guest's eyes the while, so that he might know the welcome thing to say. And how is Walker? We've not seen him just lately. Mrs. Jervis is going to send him a sucking pig one day this week. I saw him riding home this morning, said Teresa. Here's how, said Jervis, holding up his whisky. Mackintosh drank. The two women sat and looked at him. Mrs. Jervis, in her black mother Hubbard, placid and haughty, and Teresa, anxious to smile whenever she caught his eye, while the trader gossiped insufferably. They were saying in Apia it was about time Walker retired. He ain't so young as he was. Things have changed since he first come to the islands, and he ain't changed with them. He'll go too far, said the old chippers. The natives aren't satisfied. That was a good joke about the road, laughed the trader. When I told them about it in Apia, they fair split their sides with laughing, good old walker. Mackintosh looked at him savagely. What did he mean by talking of him in that fashion? To a half-caste trader, he was Mr. Walker. It was on his tongue to utter a harsh rebuke for the impertinence. He did not know what held him back. When he goes, I hope you'll take his place, Mr. Mackintosh, said Jervis. We all like you on the island. You understand the natives. They're educated now. They must be treated differently to their old days. It wants an educated man to be administrator now. Walker was only a trader, same as I am. Teresa's eyes glistened. When the time comes, if there's anything anyone can do here, you bet your bottom dollar we'll do it. I'd get all the chiefs to go over to Arpia and make a petition. Mackintosh felt horribly sick. It had not struck him that if anything happened to Walker, it might be he who would succeed him. It was true that no one in his official position knew the island so well. He got up suddenly, and scarcely taking his leave, walked back to the compound. And now he went straight to his room. He took a quick look at his desk. He rummaged among the papers. The revolver was not there. His heart thumped violently against his ribs. He looked for the revolver everywhere. He hunted in the chairs and in the drawers. He looked desperately, and all the time he knew he would not find it. Suddenly he heard Walker's gruff, hearty voice. What the devil are you up to, Mac? He started. Walker was standing in the doorway, and instinctively he turned round to hide what lay upon his desk. Tidying up? creased Walker. I've told him to put the grey in the trap. I'm going down to Tafoni to bathe. You'd better come along. All right, said Mackintosh. So long as he was with Walker, nothing could happen. The place they were bound for was about three miles away, and there was a fresh water pool, separated by a thin barrier of rock from the sea, which the administrator had blasted out for the natives to bathe in. He had done this at spots round the island, wherever there was a spring, and the fresh water compared with the sticky warmth of the sea, was cool and invigorating. They drove along the silent grassy road, splashing now and then through faults, where the sea had forced its way in, past a couple of native villages, the bell-shaped huts spaced out roomily, and the white chapel in the middle, and at the third village they got out of the trap, tied up the horse, and walked down to the pool. They were accompanied by four or five girls and a dozen children. Soon they were all splashing about, shouting and laughing, while Walker, in a lava lava, 
swarmed to and fro like an unwieldy porpoise he made lewd jokes with the girls and they amused themselves by diving under him and wriggling away when he tried to catch them when he was tired he lay down on a rock while the girls and children surrounded him it was a happy family and the old man huge with his crescent of white hair and his shining bald crown looked like some old sea god once mackintosh caught a queer soft look in his eyes they're dear children he said they look upon me as their father and then without a pause he turned to one of the girls and made an obscene remark which sent them all into fits of laughter mackintosh started to dress with his thin legs and thin arms he made a grotesque figure a sinister don quixote and walker began to make coarse jokes about him they were acknowledged with little smothered laughs mackintosh struggled with his shirt he knew he looked absurd but he hated being laughed at he stood silent and glowering if you want to get back in time for dinner you ought to come soon you're not a bad fellow mac only you're a fool when you're doing one thing you always want to do another that's not the way to live but all the same he raised himself slowly to his feet and began to put on his clothes they sauntered back to the village drank a bowl of kava with the chief and then after a joyful farewell from all the lazy villagers drove home after dinner according to his habit walker lighting his cigar prepared to go for a stroll mackintosh was suddenly seized with fear don't you think it's rather unwise to go out at night by yourself just now walker stared at him with his round blue eyes what the devil do you mean remember the knife the other night you've got those fellows backs up pooh they wouldn't dare someone dared before that was only a bluff they wouldn't hurt me they look upon me as a father they know that whatever i do is for their own good mackintosh watched him with contempt in his heart the man's self-complacency outraged him and yet something knew not what made him insist remember what happened this morning it wouldn't hurt you to stay at home just to-night i'll play piquet with you i'll play piquet with you when i come back the kanaka isn't born yet who can make me alter my plans you'd better let me come with you you stay where you are mackintosh shrugged his shoulders he had given the men full warning if he did not heed it that was his own lookout walker put on his hat and went out mackintosh began to read but then he thought of something perhaps it would be as well to have his own whereabouts quite clear he crossed over to the kitchen and inventing some pretext talked for a few minutes with the cook then he got out the gramophone and put a record on it but while it ground out its melancholy tune some comic song of a london music hall his ear was strained for a sound away there in the night at his elbow the record reeled out its loudness the words were raucous but notwithstanding he seemed to be surrounded by an unearthly silence he heard the dull roar of the breakers against the reef he heard the breeze sigh far up in the leaves of the coconut trees how long would it be it was awful he heard a hoarse laugh wonders will never cease it's not often you play yourself a tune mac walker stood at the window red-faced bluff and jovial well you see i'm alive and kicking what were you playing for walker came in nerves a bit dicky eh playing a tune to keep your pack up i was playing your requiem what the devil's that i've a beat in the pine of stout rattling good song too i don't mind how often i hear it now i'm ready to take your money off you at piquet they played and walker bullied his way to victory bluffing his opponent chaffing him jeering at his mistakes up to every dodge browbeating him exulting presently mackintosh recovered his coolness and standing outside himself as it were he was able to take a detached pleasure in watching the overbearing old man and in his own cold reserve somewhere manuma sat quietly and awaited his opportunity walker won game after game and pocketed his winnings at the end of the evening in high good humour you have to grow a little bit older before you stand much chance against me mac the fact is i have a natural gift for cards 
I don't know that there's much gift about it when I happen to deal you fourteen aces. Good cards come to good players, retorted Walker. I'd have won if I'd had your hands. He went on to tell long stories of the various occasions on which he had played cards with notorious sharpers, and to their consternation had taken all their money from them. He boasted. He praised himself. And Mackintosh listened with absorption. He wanted now to feed his hatred, and everything Walker said, every gesture, made him more detestable. At last Walker got up. Well, I'm going to turn in, he said, with a loud yawn. I've got a long day tomorrow. What are you going to do? I'm driving over to the other side of the island. I'll start at five, but I don't expect I shall get back to dinner till late. They generally died at seven. We'd better make it half past seven then. I guess it would be as well. Mackintosh watched him knock the ashes out of his pipe. His vitality was rude and exuberant. It was strange to think that death hung over him. A faint smile flickered in Mackintosh's cold, gloomy eyes. Would you like me to come with you? What in God's name should I want that for? I'm using the mare, and she'll have enough to do to carry me. She don't want to drag you over thirty miles of road. Perhaps you don't quite realise what the feeling is at Mantotu. I think it would be safer if I came with you. Walker burst into contemptuous laughter. You'd be a fine lot of use in a scrap. I'm not a great hand at getting the wind up. Now the smile passed from Mackintosh's eyes to his lips. It distorted them painfully. Quem Dios would perdire prius dimentet. What the hell is that? said Walker. Latin, answered Mackintosh as he went out. And now he chuckled. His mood had changed. He had done all he could, and the matter was in the hands of fate. He slept more soundly than he had done for weeks. When he awoke next morning, he went out. After a good night, he found a pleasant acceleration in the freshness of the early air. The sea was a more vivid blue, the sky more brilliant than on most days. The trade wind was fresh, and there was a ripple on the lagoon as the breeze brushed over it like velvet brushed the wrong way. He felt himself stronger and younger. He entered upon the day's work with zest. After luncheon, he slept again. And as evening drew on, he had the bay settled and sauntered through the bush. He seemed to see it all with new eyes. He felt more normal. The extraordinary thing was that he was able to put Walker out of his mind altogether. As far as he was concerned, he might never have existed. He returned late, hot after his ride, and bathed again. Then he sat on the veranda, smoking his pipe and looked at the day declining over the lagoon. In the sunset, the lagoon, rosy and purple and green, was very beautiful. He felt at peace with the world and with himself. When the cook came out to say that dinner was ready and to ask whether he should wait, Mackintosh smiled at him with friendly eyes. He looked at his watch. It's half past seven. Better not wait. One can't tell when the boss be back. The boy nodded. And in a moment, Mackintosh saw him carry across the yard a bowl of steaming soup. He got up lazily, went into the dining room, and ate his dinner. Had it happened? The uncertainty was amusing, and Mackintosh chuckled in the silence. The food did not seem so monotonous as usual, and even though there was a hamburger stick, the cook's invariable dish, when his poor invention failed him, it tasted by some miracle succulent and spiced. After dinner, he strolled over lazily to his bungalow to get a book. He liked the intense stillness. And now that the night had fallen, the stars were blazing in the sky. He shouted for a lamp, and in a moment the chink pattered over on his bare feet, piercing the darkness with a ray of light. He put the lamp on the desk and noiselessly slipped out of the room. Mackintosh stood rooted to the floor, for there, half hidden by untidy papers, was his revolver. His heart thrummed painfully, and he broke into a sweat. It was done then. 
He took up the revolver with a shaking hand. Four of the chambers were empty. He paused a moment and looked suspiciously out into the night. But there was no one there. He quickly slipped four cartridges into the empty chambers and locked the revolver in his drawer. He sat down to wait. An hour passed. A second hour passed. There was nothing. He sat at his desk as though he were writing, but he neither wrote nor read. He merely listened. He strained his ears for a sound travelling from a far distance. At last he heard hesitating footsteps and knew it was the Chinese cook. Asan, he called. The boy came to the door. Was very slate, he said. Dinner no good. Mackintosh stared at him, wondering whether he knew what had happened, and whether, when he knew, he would realise on what terms he and Walker had been. He went about his work, sleek, silent, and smiling, and who could tell his thoughts? I expect he's had dinner on the way, but you must keep the soup hot at all events. The words were hardly out of his mouth when the silence was suddenly broken into by a confusion cries and the rapid patter of naked feet a number of natives ran into the compound men and women and children they crowded round mackintosh and they all talked at once they were unintelligible they were excited and frightened and some of them were crying mackintosh pushed his way through them and went to the gateway though he had scarcely understood what they said he knew quite well what had happened and as he reached the gate the dog cart arrived the old mare was being led by a tall kanaka and in the dog cart crouched two men trying to hold walker up a little crowd of natives surrounded it the mare was led into the yard and the natives surged in after it mackintosh shouted to them to stand back and the two policemen sprang suddenly from god knows where pushed them violently aside by now he had managed to understand that some lads who had been fishing on their way back to the village had come across the cart on the home side of the ford. The mare was nuzzling about the herbage and in the darkness they could see the great white bulk of the old man sunk between the seat and the dashboard. At first they thought he was drunk and they peered in, grinning, but then they heard him groan and guessed that something was amiss. They ran to the village and called for help. It was when they returned, accompanied by half a hundred people, that they discovered Walker had been shot. With a sudden thrill of horror, Mackintosh asked himself whether he was already dead. The first thing at all events was to get him out of the cart, and that, owing to Walker's corpulence, was a difficult job. It took four strong men to lift him, they jolted him, and he uttered a dull groan. He was still alive. At last, they carried him into the house, up the stairs, and placed him on his bed. Then Mackintosh was able to see him. For in the yard, lit only by half a dozen Harry King lambs, everything had been obscured. Walker's white ducks were stained with blood, and the men who had carried him wiped their hands, red and sticky, on their lava lavas. Mackintosh held up the lamp. He had not expected the old man to be so pale. His eyes were closed. He was breathing still. His pulse could be just felt. But it was obvious that he was dying. Mackintosh had not bargained for the shock of horror that convulsed him. He saw that the native clerk was there, and in a voice hoarse with fear, told him to go into the dispensary and get what was necessary for a hypodermic injection. One of the policemen had brought up the whisky, and Mackintosh forced a little into the old man's mouth. The room was crowded with natives. They sat about the floor, speechless now, and then one wailed aloud. It was very hot, but Mackintosh felt cold. His hands and his feet were like ice, and he had to make a violent effort not to tremble in all his limbs. He did not know what to do. He did not know if Walker was bleeding still, and if he was, how he could stop the bleeding. The clerk brought the hypodermic needle. You give it to him, said Mackintosh. 
You're more used to that sort of thing than I am. His head ached horribly. It felt as though all sorts of little savage things were beating inside it, trying to get out. They watched for the effect of the injection. Presently Walker opened his eyes slowly. He did not seem to know where he was. Keep quiet, said Mackintosh. You're at home. You're quite safe. Walker's lips outlined a shadowy smile. They've got me, he whispered. I'll get Jervis to send his motorboat to Apia at once. We'll get the doctor out by tomorrow afternoon. There was a long pause before the old man answered. I shall be dead by then. A ghastly expression passed over Mackintosh's pale face. He forced himself to laugh. What rot? You keep quiet and you'll be as right as rain. Give me a drink, said Walker. A stiff one. With shaking hands, Mackintosh poured out whiskey and water, half and half, and held a glass while Walker drank greedily. It seemed to restore him. He gave a long sigh, and a little colour came into his great fleshy face. Mackintosh felt extraordinarily helpless. He stood and stared at the old man. If you tell me what to do, I'll do it, he said. There's nothing to do. Just leave me alone. I'm done for. He looked dreadfully pitiful as he lay on the great bed, a huge, bloated old man, but so wan, so weak. It was heart-rending. As he rested, his mind seemed to grow clearer. You were right, Mac, he said presently. You want me. I wish to God I'd come with you. You're a good chap, Mac, only you don't drink. There was another long silence and it was clear that Walker was sinking. There was an internal hemorrhage, and even Mackintosh, in his ignorance, could not fail to see that his chief had but an hour or two to live. He stood by the side of the bedstock still. For half an hour, perhaps, Walker lay with his eyes closed. Then he opened them. They'll give you my job, he said, slowly. Last time I was in Apia, I told them you were all right. Finish my road. I want to think that'll be done, all round the island. I don't want your job. You get all right. Walker shook his head wearily. I've had my day. Treat them fairly. That's the great thing. Their children. You must always remember that. You must be firm with them. But you must be kind. And you must be just. I've never made a bob out of them. I haven't saved a hundred pounds in twenty years. The road's the great thing. Get the road finished. Something very really like a sob was wrung up from Mackintosh. You good fellow, Mac. I always liked you. He closed his eyes, and Mackintosh thought that he would never open them again. His mouth was so dry that he had to get himself something to drink. The Chinese cook silently put a chair for him. He sat down by the side of the bed and waited. He did not know how long a time passed. The night was endless. Suddenly, one of the men sitting there broke into uncontrollable sobbing, loudly, like a child. And Mackintosh grew aware that the room was crowded by this time with natives. They sat all over the floor on their hunches, men and women, staring at the bed. What are all these people doing here? said Mackintosh. They've got no right. Turn them out. Turn them out, all of them. His words seemed to rouse Walker, for he opened his eyes once more, and now they were all misty. He wanted to speak, but he was so weak that Mackintosh had to string his ears to catch what he said. Let them stay. They are my children. They ought to be here. Mackintosh turned to the natives. Stay where you are. He wants you, but be silent. A faint smile came over the old man's white face. Come nearer, he said. Mackintosh bent over him. His eyes were closed, and the words he said were like a wind sighing through the fronds of the coconut trees. Give me another drink. I've got something to say. This time Mackintosh gave him his whiskey neat. Walker collected his strength in a final effort of will. Don't make a fuss about this. In 95, when there were troubles, white men were killed, and the fleet came and shelled the villages. A lot of people were killed, who had nothing to do with it. 
they're damned fools and up here. If they make a fuss, they only punish the wrong people. I don't want anyone punished. He paused for a while to rest. You must say it was an accident. No one's to blame. Promise me that. I'll do anything you like, whispered Mackintosh. Good chap. One of the best. They're children. I'm their father. A father don't let his children get into trouble if he can help it. A ghost of a chuckle came out of his throat. It was astonishingly weird and ghastly. You're a religious chap, Mag. What's that about forgiving them, you know? For a while Mackintosh did not answer, his lips trembled. Forgive them, but they know not what they do. That's right, forgive them. I've loved them, you know, always loved them. He sighed. His lips faintly moved, and now Mackintosh had to put his ears quite close to them in order to hear. Hold my hand, he said. Mackintosh gave a gasp. His heart seemed wrenched. He took the old man's hand, so cold and weak, a coarse, rough hand, and held it in his own. And thus he sat until he nearly started out of his seat, for the silence was suddenly broken by a long rattle. It was terrible and unearthly. Walker was dead. Then the natives broke out with loud cries. The tears ran down their faces, and they beat their breasts. Mackintosh disengaged his hand from the dead man's, and staggering like one drunk with sleep, he went out of the room. He went to the locked drawer in his writing desk and took out a revolver. He walked down to the sea and walked into the lagoon. He waded out cautiously, so that he should not trip against a coral rock. Till the water came to his armpits, then he put a bullet through his head. An hour later, half a dozen slim brown sharks were splashing and struggling at the spot where he fell. End of section 3, Macintosh, part 2